All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So good afternoon, and thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to present a very quick perspective and rather personal take on atomically precise device fabrication, um, which we hope uh, can be accelerated uh, also in the context of Fermat. And this is in the context of all these keywords here, uh, multi-component molecular devices by interfacing mass spectrometry, scanning probe microscopy, photo emission microscopy, and computational modeling. Okay, that was a, a mouthful. Uh, but it is needed because we are uh, vacuum physicists working in uh, Beijing and also here in Iris Adasov. Um, and uh, in this context, it's very exciting to introduce, uh, to set the scene of this perspective, introducing first what is nanofabrication and the state of the art of nanofabrication. And it is one of these machines, which is an ASML machine. And for us vacuum physicists, it's very exciting because it's a vacuum chamber with a robot inside, with state-of-the-art optics and uh, plasma sources, right? Uh, so um, you can do a lot of science with these kind of machines. Unfortunately, you can see that the work is, has been only cited 34 times, and this is uh, because uh, it's probably just building the chips of all of our uh, computers and <laughs> handheld devices right now. So less exciting uh, than the technology behind this is to describe tra traditional nanofabrication, which I could argue that is a hammer and chisel approach uh, to fabricating at the nanoscale, putting components, uh, deciding where these components go on the platform. And you do this enough times, you put enough money uh, on this and you can fabricate uh, five nanometer features. Uh, this is in contrast to what most of our scientists can do in the lab. Uh, we just put carbon on the surface, a polymeric precursor, and then we would have, we heat it up and then we will have um, pseudo graphene electrodes contacting uh, 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 single uh, uh, device elements, right? And uh, of course, this is not uh, scalable yet. So one of the questions is that how to accelerate such emerging procedures? We have heard how to accelerate established technologies in Fermat, but how can uh, Fermat approaches accelerate such uh, uh, initiatives? And how long will it take to build one of these big instrumentations for atomically precise fabrication? Now, I would argue that uh, the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, is this complete? Can somebody reproduce this in the lab? And I think not, right? So we first need, one of the first steps is to expand uh, chemical equations. And I would represent this with feedback cycles. Everything that we did to put this, to claim that this spontaneously occurs, right? Otherwise people will be lost. And we have heard about this, about metadata optimization, decision-making process. But I would say it is not only about engineering, it's not only about making fair, there is a real urgency right now. There is a real urgency in describing complex equations. So I go to the literature and people say, you have 90% crystallinity of something, but what is the domain science with which technique? And these are real master students and real students that are you know, giving them, we give them a material. So people say this, the literature say this, and then after three years, many tasks, many, uh, a lot of information is lost and a lot of time and effort and money because it was not well described. Um, so um, we need to start putting not only uh, the, the, the Fermat uh, approaches to this, but really as much parameters as possible. We need to change chemical reactions. So this is a, a little bit provocative, but we can discuss, discuss this uh, in the next time. So uh, 12 years ago, our approach to trying to complete a chemical equation in complex materials was we would do the uh, experiment in, in, in scanning probe microscopy of uh, putting two molecules together. And in parallel, we, well, me and, uh, and a student would do the simulations. And then we will take the simulation. So these are not molecules just on top of, of, of what we have. No, this is separate simulations. And we will refine this until we were able to come up with a perfect chemical equation. The fact that we have exactly the same parameters and with 48 molecules here and 32 molecules, we, we always find defect-free lattices. And this is not a small deal. This is two or three years of research. So of course we could only simulate an equation. We wanted to do this experiment, put it on the microscope to see if this is an actual first complete chemical reaction of a complex system. Uh, but instead of that, we did the, the we, we went down to a more sophisticated level 
of uh, reproduction, and we said, no, let's just focus first on one single molecule if we're going to put three years on this experiment. And then we now are not focusing on the metal organic network, but on a molecule diffusing inside the metal organic network. Same procedure, experiment. So this is the experiment at 8 Kelvin. Um, uh, um, feedback loops between force field design, DFT calculations, and to, in order to reproduce the entire free energy space of a molecule for the first time. So we call this the first uh, partition function that can be measured, so we can measure free energies with these microscopes. And here, what is the equation? <laughs> so for here, we have to just demonstrate this equation, which is a simulation, but the equation will be the fact that we can predict, the, well, not predict, because it's not about prediction, it's just about expressing the equations correctly. We can express what will happen at one Kelvin, at 30 Kelvin, and at 300 Kelvin, if we bias the, the pattern. Otherwise, if I show you just the, the molecule diffusing, you, you will not see it. Uh, it's very interesting. And this molecule is not self-assembling. Is not polymorphic or non-polymorphic. This molecule is self-fabricating a pattern at different temperatures, right? Okay, but now get, let's go. Let's move on to a more traditional approach: the device, right? Uh, something that we we'll, we call uh, like a much um, more traditional device. So in this case, again, very dumb experiment. The simplest that we can do: we put graphene nanoribbon precursors together with gold, and we mix them, and we hope to get patchy nano circuits at the next generation of computing devices. Very simple. And so we spent five years on this, trying to get this uh, uh, together and putting gold on top, and this is what we get. So <laughs> we have no idea how to name this. <laughs> we have no idea how to name this, and we have not been able to find the parameters to make it reproducible. So it will take us five years or even a decade more in order to express a, uh, a complete chemical equation for a self-assembled device, right? So what can we do still in this regard? We can say, okay, the next step is to try to automatize parameter exploration. Um, uh, to make really parameter monitoring a, a, a loop, a node in this big network reaction. And uh, one decade ago, we started and saying, okay, it's very simple. Let's try to get funded a high, uh, a multi-technique HPLC system uh, with all the inline multi-techniques on the surfaces. And we couldn't get it funded 10 years ago. Uh, now it's very popular uh, all over the world. But uh, luckily, something that we could get funded was a more traditional physics-only approach to multi-techniques, which is let's get uh, chambers that have a uh, photo emission microscopy, mass spectrometry, uh, very high-end sublimation fluxes and low temperature scanning pro microscopy together, and let's automatize it. So this was 10 years in the making. Now we have these two machines, one here in, uh, near the saddles of another one in Beijing. And what can we do with uh, such machines? We can uh, very accurately follow uh, parameter depositions, such as a layer density at the temperature. So this is uh, a temperature uh, spectroscopy measurement. So we just uh, dissolve from measurement, uh, temperature dissolve from measurement. So uh, we just uh, scan the temperature at, at every single uh, peak here. We can know how many molecules, and we're not talking about uh, moles, right? We're talking about fractions of moles. So this is, we, we estimate that each of these peaks are something like uh, uh, anywhere between a million and 10 million molecules um, on the surface, right? And we can compare this, of course, in real space and so on. And then we're doing layer by layer metal organic network uh, printing with this. Um, what else can we do? We can, of course, for more complex materials, we can do time of flight spectrometry. So we have uh, 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 chemical resolution besides atomic resolution, and we need to zoom out to check the scale of our devices. So we have uh, microscopic resolution. Um, now, just very simple. We think that in order to accelerate this, we also need open science initiatives. So uh, also one decade ago, well, over less, uh, we tried to fund open uh, research platforms in with collaboration with Berkeley Volunteer Computing and also some uh, people that are experts on how to outsource experiments to the citizens like in uh, our colleagues in, in, in Stanford. Uh, we could not get it funded, but we have now in a, a funded outreach project, uh, which you know we, we hope it will grow at one point. So with that, I hope I uh, managed to convey not only that we have a lot of skin in this game since decades, uh, but that uh, in order to accelerate uh, uh, new emerging technologies like self-fabrication, we not only need, uh, we, it, I mean, completing and following the fair approaches might not be a choice, might be just a way to go, right? Otherwise, these technologies will not emerge. And with that, of course, I would like to thank the many chemistry and the many physics throughout the years 
Um, the funders, there's always open positions. And uh, you for your attention.